show you there. Okay, uh, today we're looking at really uh, TMMT is what I'm using for translation memories with or without machine translation. Uh, I hope you all will know what translation memories are. I hope you're all using at least one with a normal translation work. I hope. Who does, by the way? Raise your hand if you do. Raise your hand if you don't. You very brave people coming out into the world of professional translation, not armed with a translation memory. Very courageous of you. They're very expensive. Rubbish. There are free ones out there, and there are cracks for everything else. <laughs> Just ask your Chinese colleagues. <laughs> Yeah, no, if, you, if you're going into the professional world, you're not going to share exactly. the memories, obviously, because of confidentiality problems. Right, and that's, uh, at least from the free ones I've seen, and I haven't seen a free one that like, gives you the option of... Memo queue? No. Yeah. There you go. For example. Give it a thing. Word fast, dirt cheap. Okay, there are very expensive ones. Um, that's not something I'm looking at, actually. Very. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but I think if you're going out, well, okay, people who used a translation memory regularly, hands up again. Good. Keep your hand up if you would go back to not having it. I rest my case. Okay, once you get used to it, you won't go back. It's a bit like you know, people didn't want to use typewriter. Uh, typewriter. They didn't want to use typewriters, yeah. Much noise is mechanical, I have to write my literature with my pen. And then they don't want to use computers, but you go if you go to using a computer, you complain for two weeks, but you don't go back. Uh, the TMs have become a bit like that. For all their drawbacks, for all we complain, uh, people who make the shift do not move back. Some people do. Okay. Some people. Uh, for that reason, I think whether or not you're still resisting, it's a tendency that we have to accept. And it's of interest to us, I think, to know if it's good or bad, in general terms. Good or bad for what? For our productivity, for the quality of our translations, for our psychological well being, for our job satisfaction. Anything else you want to know? Oh, and your financial situation. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, there are many claims and counterclaims out there. Uh, we'll see here what research can tell us about that. That's why I think it's an interesting topic to look at because I think we're all involved in this uh, technological change. Okay. Just uh, to indicate, it's not a recent phenomenon. I'm not talking about machine translation, but true. Machine translation dates from code breaking at, at, towards the end of the Second World War. So machine translation has been around for a long, long time. Uh, and, and the models uh, developed in the 20s and 30s. Translation memory, which is a very simple thing, copy the translation segments the pairs we produce and reuse them, uh, was developed in the 1980s. So it's not really new. And it filled the gap left by research on machine translation. You'll we'll know that machine translation really went well into the mid-70s, and then people gave up on it, more or less. It disappeared from view. And uh, machine translation came in to fill the place. They said, we're not going to get high-level uh, automatic machine translation. Uh, let's find something which is uh, with human intervention and machines together. And this uh, translation memory sort of filled that gap for a while. Machine translation has come back with a vengeance in the last 10 years, of course. Uh, in the 80s, first commercial use from uh, the early 1990s. This is when it started to be called CAT tools. CAT means computer-aided translation. It's an absurd term. My humble way of thinking, 
because I don't see any translating that is not computer aided. Okay. Are you translating without a computer? Out there. And a lot of interpreting. It's good to have a computer in the booth. So, the cat tools, it's a term that stuck with us, though, unfortunately. Kronos was one of the very early leaders that's managed to maintain that market position. Um, <coughs> Uh, an important breakthrough was TMX in 2002, developed by the Localization Industry Standards Association. TMX is simply the, uh, the, the code that enabled memories to be shared by the different platforms. So, for example, if you've been working in Deja Vu for 10 years, you've got 10 years of your life as a translator store there. It's your money in the bank, really and you want to start working with Tranos, or a client makes you work with Tranos, with TMX, in theory, you can move your memories from one to the other. Okay? And this was very good for the industry, if and when it worked. Then again, at, at my university in Spain, uh, we used a Deja Vu for, for 10 years, and then bought DVX, Deja Vu X, and couldn't transfer the memories from one system, even within the same <clears throat> memory tool. Uh, so, you know, it's a land by technological bugs. So that's a mixed metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> it's a land by technological bombs. So, okay. 2009 was, was very important because of the release of Google Translation Toolkit which um, is, is the, it's certainly not the only one out there to integrate MT, uh, but the fact that it was free, the fact that it was using fairly uh, big um, MT uh, databases, and the fact that it, it was oriented towards a free user market, it was not a professional tool, took a lot of people by surprise. You know, we, people knew that Google was working on that, we thought they would bring out something like Travos, that is an industry tool with terminology management, uh, something that would take the whole market over, as Google tends to do. Instead, they didn't. They, they developed a tool which is extremely accessible, um, is usually productive, depending on the databases for the languages, and is specially designed for volunteer translators, collaborative translation, uh, people are going to have fun with it, people are going to do Wikipedia with it. Uh, so, it really has changed things a lot because it's made, made MT and TM technology part of what young people do for fun. Prior to that, these technologies were something that separated the professionals from the, from the non-professionals. For many years in, in Spain, I had a master's course that specialized in translation technology. I'd get professional translators signing up for this one-year course. What are you signing up for? I want to know how to use Travos. I say, you idiot, just buy it and go through the tutorial, read the instructions. I tried it, but I didn't know. I got scared. <laughs> so we made a lot of money out of holding people's hands <laughs> while they applied the tutorials for Travos, you know, and, and they show you. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but and they would pay quite a lot of money because it moved them from one market segment to the next. Now they could tell their clients, oh yes, I can use Travos and Deja Vu, the, the, the main tools we had there. And it, 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 it expanded their, not only their productivity, which it did, but their uh, client base as well. 2010, uh, we've got other things. WordFast Anywhere came out, which is web-based WordFast. And, um, there's been a definite tendency in the past two years towards computing in the cloud, as it's called, where, where you're not storing data on your computer, you're storing it in Google land or Apple land, or other people have access to all our information and we're somehow pleased about that. What are the kinds of questions we could ask or we would like to have answered? And the most frequent questions that we get are people come to us and say, well, what, what TM should I use? Or which platform should I use? Uh, that's a very hard question for people to ask of researchers. 
Why can't a researcher answer that question? Very easily. Okay, I, I spend some of my time actually doing research, and I spend a lot more of it applying for research funding, which is the hardest part. Uh, now, if I conceptualize my project now, it, it's still 2011, all right, and I get my team together, I might apply for the funding in what? March 2012, six months later, September, I get a reply on the funding, okay? It's a three year, first of seven, 2012, September 2015, I finish my experiments, because we do them properly, with lots of subjects and repeat tests. Then um, we write it up, the last six months, 2016, and it takes one year to get it published in a prestigious journal, 2017. Five years. Five years is a conservative estimate of how long it takes from conceptualizing a research project to publishing the findings. Do you think that in five years the, the tools you're using now are going to exist? Yeah, exist? Yeah. Will they be the same? No. Certainly not. Uh, the, the field is changing far faster than uh, serious empirical research. Can, uh, can handle. We can't keep up with it. It's just not a question that I can answer. If people ask me that and they want details about it, I tell them to go and look for information among user groups. Pick the ones people want answered and not the ones that research can provide answers to. That's, that's my point. Don't come and ask us to do what we can't do, because we're five years late. Research on this because serious academic research is, is too late, basically. You get a lot of things uh, out there in industry publications, that is, online journals, blogs, uh, translated groups, uh, pros and things like that. Um, and they're usually really quick things with very few subjects, and um, usually extol the virtues of the company the researcher works for. Okay, these are the sort of things done by people working or uh, companies developing tools or marketing tools. And they're incredibly biased. Okay? Uh, but this is how a lot of the information gets out there. Lots of discussion lists. You can find discussion lists for the users of any tool. So with whichever one you're using, look around, you'll find a discussion list. If you've got a problem with it, you've got a problem with how much do I charge, what do I do with fuzzy matches, ask people there, you'll get good answers but within the communities. And a lot of them, especially if Deja Vu and WordFast, the cheaper ones that have been around for a long time, it's like a football team. You know, they'll really support you because they want you to belong to their football team, not with that other one over there, the big bad Kratos, or even worse, anything out of Microsoft. Or, okay. If you know this well, uh, a lot of information circulates through the discussion list. Not research, though. It's more like football team propaganda and slogans. Most of the research we've done is amazingly at MA level, that's you guys doing this sort of stuff, at PhD projects. There's no major book on this issue. It takes too long to publish a book. Things, things change too much. It's just, I just, to indicate the, uh, the dates. I don't expect you to read these things, but just to know they're out there. There are quite a few descriptions of how tools work, but the descriptions get out of date really quickly. I'm going to amaze people to publish them. We wouldn't if you do that now. There are case studies of productivity. To know if it's helping people, it's interesting to go into a company and see the company prior to the introduction of the tool and afterwards and look at the actual productivity statistics that include the learning curve, uh, the hours developed uh, to get used to it, the hours needed to build up translation memories, hours needed to keep those memories clean. Variables, you can compare TM with MT, if you like. You can compare them with non-TM-MT, which is fully human translation. And the simplest experiment is to get people to do 
a translation with a DA and then without a DA. But you can compare different teams. Lots of, lots of different things. You can look at what happens when you use a TM, how does it affect the distribution of time on task, sort of things you can do in the practical parts. Do you do more or less revision? Translation quality, though, is the main concern. And we get into a whole problem of what is quality and how do you define it. Okay. But that's, that's the thing where people really look at. It's claimed that if you use a translation memory, the quality won't be as good. Is there any truth to that? Ah. Well, do you think? If you use a translation memory, will your translation be as good as a handmade product? Maybe. Why not? Why so? Any idea? People, you're doing it, aren't you? You think you're better now than you were before? I mean, it, it's a misleading question, I think. Uh, because if you want better quality, you do more revisions. And if you, whatever you're doing with the TM or without, you're going to be doing revisions. So, if the TM makes it go fast, you can spend more time revising so you can have better quality. But if you don't spend more time revising, you might have worse quality. And then it depends how you want to define quality. But, I mean, it's, it's too simple a question, unless you look at the role of revision. Does it change your thinking process? And this is more interesting, I think. Why? Um, because... The translation memory can do two things. Often we think they just do one thing. They store your previous work and bring it back. That is text reuse. But they do two things. One is segmentation. They chop up the text into small bits. That's the first thing they do. And that affects the amount of text you look at when you translate. Okay, so that's the first cognitive effect. And the second effect is the text reuse thing. That the, the translation I did over there with that text two years ago, in this segment, will serve me now in this text here. When we know that language is always used in situation, and you change the situation, you change what you say. So how can there be text reuse? That's the other problem. Translation memory, so it's probably not even one variable. It's at least two variables. Text reuse is one, segmentation is the other. And to look at that, you have to separate those two variables. Novices versus professional. Do you think novices with TMs do worse than professionals with TMs? It's a, it happens to be a very interesting question. I've got to go fast to remember that. Um, novices often do better because they're better with technology. If you're younger, you're better with technology. 